All right. Should we go? Probably, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm here to introduce Stephanie. Nowhere to be seen, but she'll appear soon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we like some artists for chancing on something unsurpassable, then keeping their course constant. We like other artists for shooting for an unachievable ideal, approaching it asymptotically year after year. And we like certain adventuresome artists for seeking and uncovering a new style, a new self in each new work. Think, if you like, of William Butler Yeats, tossing off his coat covered with embroideries out of old mythologies, or think of him telling off his frenemies. The friends that have I do it wrong whenever I remake a song should know what issue is at stake. It is myself that I remake. Chris, did you just ask us to think of Yeats naked? <laughs> well, we're getting there. <laughs> Think, if you like, of Taylor Swift, who at 12 a.m. today had either a Cinderella moment or its inverse when she released her 10th album, Midnights, making her frankest disclosures under fluffy layers of synth pop. <laughs> it's me. Hi. I'm the problem. It's me. <laughs> if you like Yates and you like Swift, if you like Cinderella's and Elsa, if you like comic books and the turkeys redirecting traffic in Harvard Square, then like me, you'll likely like another artist of remaking and reinvention, Stephanie Burt. She's the author, co-author, and editor of a sturdy shelf's worth of poetry and criticism. If you line up all her books and chapbooks in chronological order, you'll notice that her recent titles have something to say to you. The poem is you, one book affirms. Don't read poetry warns another, <laughs> clarifying its aims in a subtitle, a book about how to read poems. And now her latest collection of poetry makes an announcement fit for all the shapeshifters and role players and masked personae in this room and in this book, We Are Mermaids. It's her most capacious book yet, and its capaciousness grows with each new reader who proclaims its title or joins in with its dedication for all the letters in our alphabet and the people inside them. That phrase can encompass variously the LGBTQ plus community with its chromatic scale of identities. It can encompass anyone who reads texts or reads into texts in search of people they'd like to be or be with. And it encompasses all of us who speak or write or, or tweet or sign ourselves into existence in real time whether in public performance or in private codes. But why stop at the alphabet? Six poems and We Are Mermaids assume the voices of those everywhere found but seldom heard characters, punctuation marks. A couple of parentheses admit, we too feel uneasy alone. An extroverted M dash proclaims, I'm proud of my work, if you can call it work. I am also fond of far off lightning and completed connections and 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 and. Have you ever heard a line of iambic tetrameter that perfect? <laughs> Other poems speak as or to a cast of X-Men and flowers, sparrows and werewolves, pirate queens and parasols, prizing their plural pronouns wide open to give voice to solidarity, in jokes and trust. All these imagined speakers realistically enough have restless imaginations all their own. In a persona poem called, I'll try to get this right, Boeing 757s, Airbus 320s, and an Embraer 190. A speaking airplane recounts, my friends and I have invented, better to say discovered, a kind of religion, according to which we are dragons, voluntarily, our sect has it, taking into ourselves this diminutive, fragile, but also, as we now know, sentient species with almost no hide, two eyes, and thin vestigial wings, a species that needs our help just to get in the air. <laughs> These fantasies within fantasies fly in the face of what psychologists call depressive realism, the hypothesis that to be sadder is to be wiser, a sometimes ubiquitous seeming idea in poetry today. Mm -hmm. Bert's latest poems find their wisdom in trans joy, in exuberance, in what Bert has called the nearly Baroque and in what the kids once call and probably no longer call being extra. Splash, <laughs> splashy displays of excess, that kick off from the crumbly shores of normalcy. And all of these poems share the premise that any life, whether human or mutant or animal or mechanical, includes imagining how life could have gone otherwise. You could have run away or grown some other way. Who did you want to be before you knew who you're going to be today? Well, my last page. Oh no. Thanks, <laughs>
Let me leave you with a happy paradox about this book. Wow. If it's Bert's most capacious book to date, it's also her most unmistakably Stephanie. By that, I mean, on the one hand, that it rifles through and reframes memories from the Potomac River 1982 to my 1994. It strikes me as her most autobiographical book, or maybe her most autobiographical-ish. I'll leave it to her to say. I mean, on the second hand, that it doubles down on her small scale experiments with form and genre, her time warping translations from the Greek, her love poems unashamed to carry the title love poem, and her virtuosity with rhymes and half rhymes, which can keep the beat as evenly as drum machines or take a clamorous solo. I mean, on my hypothetical third hand, that this book shows off Stephanie the critic as she rewatches films from Some Like It Hot to Frozen or peers closely at Cabbage White's White Snow and even whiter Boston suburbs. And I mean on a fourth hand or a merman, merman fin, let's say, that Stephanie's poetry has never sounded so immediate, so skin close and crushing mm. against what she calls the urban legend or myth that we never say what we mean or even try she is gracefully ready to put the best words in their best order, as in the gentle advice of her love poem with archery. Do what I do. You have time. Put your hand over my hand. That feels nice. Don't worry if her forthright, unironic words skirt cliche, as the gorgeous poem Rambutan can remind you. Cliche means clench, clutch, and predictable, but also sometimes true. That poem ends, sometimes I feel tenderly opened up, wet and revealed as if cut into. I want to spend today with you. We Are Mermaids is a book we can all spend time in, but it took one singular poet to write it. I'll end by reading from the back of this new book. Stephanie Burt is professor of English across the street. <laughs> Her books of poetry and literary criticism include Advice from the Lights and Close Calls with Nonsense Reading New Poetry, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. She is, of course, a mermaid. Maybe you are too. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Burton. Wow. Wow, thank you all for being here. Um, you got some air circulation and I, I found a lipstick I thought worked with, with the mermaid stuff. So I'm gonna take this off and play with this. Chris, thank you. Um, you should all look for Chris's literary criticism and literary essays and poems because they're really good. Um, there have been some in Poetry Magazine. Uh, that we, where's what's the most recent? Plowshares, cool. Are you are you in the current plowshares? Maybe the last one. Okay. Do you have the current plowshares around? Sometimes you have magazines. Anyway, yes. older. older ones. Uh, everyone, we have, okay. No, thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming out tonight, and um, to everyone online, uh, and to this Boston Cambridge institution. And um, I told a couple people that if they showed up online, they could request poems using the chat function. So I don't know if you're open to that. Will you let me know when it's been kind of half an hour-y? Okay. Okay, because I just turned off my phone. Wow, yeah. Thank you for being here. Oh my God, I don't know what to do. Miami. Not the sense of standing alone in front of a microphone, but the adjustments of playing along with a more experienced band. Not the fear of representing an establishment, but of representing it badly, of being inundated and then shipped home. The scallops whose breathing tubes pop up above the receding salt water through the overlaps of sand, the fear you'll sink like a skipped stone, the past as it grows away from you is thickening. The young reader in the too often washed Avengers t-shirt with the collar cut out had asked, how do you deal with the fear of existing? 
the insubstantial feeling that came to you then, the vertigo and the quickening. I like lime. Rhyme is fun. I, I thought I was supposed to avoid it at one point and I felt bad for not avoiding it. And then I read Laura Kashisky and Angie Estes and other people just a little bit older than me who were really good at using rhyme irregularly. And I decided I wanted to do that all the time. Potomac River, 1982. Where I grew up, it was all wonderful and defensive. The adults were kind and never neglectful, bringing fresh water and grapes, oranges and juice and sunscreen, always asking each kid what we would need or might need in the anticipated future with its goldenrod bordered cleared field, its soft black top, its estimated yield. We were told to look up with reason to keep looking forward to a cloudless sky punctuated by drones. We had to hide to be alone. I just thought this was my most autobiographical book, so I'm reading autobiography-ish stuff. And I do take requests for what it's worth. Um, and uh, it is a Boston book. Any record hospital DJs in the audience? No, just as well. Are those like indie rock people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My 1993. I lived in a closet. Also, I lived in a closet <laughs> belonging to my then best friends, then beau, who lived with three other men in a central square walk up spacious and sunlit, except for the closet. <laughs> the closet abutted Horace's bedroom. Horace is like, but not quite his real name. Horace lived as a rent boy for a B-school professor. <laughs> the others did, I never knew what they did, that is consulting. <laughs> <laughs> I was proud to be the new coat chick girl at a cavernous bowling alley recently made over into a cavernous rock club. I was working for tips. I wanted to say I was working. Really, I was playing at self-sufficiency. Mostly, I was playing records nobody else liked for two hours a night, <laughs> or four if the next DJ never showed up. I liked to pretend that other people were listening. Sometimes they called me up. I felt at home where no one could see me. I liked the Verlaines and Tree People, Small Factory, Circus Lupus and Some Velvet Sidewalk, the Dead Sea and the Spinanes, who sang about thirsty anime in a voice like sour cherries, sweet with overtones of sharp and ripe and bloodstain. When I moved out, I lost two crates along with a cardboard box of 25 10-year-old vinyl LPs I took home, home meaning the closet, <laughs> when the former guitarist was throwing them away, black and white, with a picture of an angry toddler running. Their most famous song was about not being famous, not being in school or employed, just hanging out in the Boston rock scene. The band was called Sorry. They broke up before I could see them. The album was called Imaginary Friend. I feel like a creep digging person. Like <laughs> if you ever see it, I mean, they were two albums. The other one, which is actually a better album is called The Way It Is. I believe it is not on Spotify. <laughs> uh, if you were in a position to fix that, cause you know, you own the master tapes, like do something about it. Cause they were really good. Stephanie, we have a request from the chat. Yes. It's from Catherine Scott, and the request is for Prayer for Werewolves. Oh, sure. Do you have Catherine's chapbook here? We don't, we should. Catherine, can you get the Grow Your Poetry <laughs> bookshop your chapbook? Because it's really good. If you, put, if you put in the chat the name of the chapbook, we'll be able to announce the name of the chapbook so people will know when it comes in. Okay. Um, 
Anyone here know who Rain Sinclair is? Oh no. <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> She's doing okay now. Um, if if you um, it's worth googling. Her first name is spelled R A H N E. Prayer for werewolves. Someone will probably love you for who you are. If not, you'll still find friends. Friends who, given time or given warning, will probably gather around you, hold your hands, and wrap you in soft coats and blankets till the violence inside your body ends. Someone will probably love you for who you are, not just for who you labor to be. Maybe you're lost in your skin today. Maybe you're burning and wish you could tear it all off. Please don't. You are variously a marvel, an athlete, a wilderness, a source of warmth, and a way to learn from fear. When you have claws, your claws are yours. Your ears bristle and are yours. Your irises are citrine, pure, and yours. They let you see through smog and pine thickets and into the future where you need no chains to feel secure. And someone will probably love you for who you are. Then you will know each other's secrets and nuzzle or lope together. But for now you have friends who are not going anywhere. Please stay here. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, a bit of a lighter one, sort of. Am I, is this, okay, good. Yeah, this isn't, are we good in terms of sound? Good sound quality? Cinderella. There are a number of uh, queer retellings of the Cinderella story in a uh, whole bunch of YA novels these days. One is Cinder by Melinda Lowe, who, yeah, okay, we know who Melinda Lowe is, good. She's not here, is she? Okay, <laughs> she lives in Arlington. Okay. Cinderella. The trans story is, the heroine has to be trans because nobody else in the capital shares her size. <laughs> the prince must roam from house to house from mansion to cottage to townhouse, trying to find the one girl who came to the winter solstice ball in glass slippers. They must have hurt like hell by the end of the night, even rightly sized, with heels at least one and a half inch high and more important in ladies 13 and a half. <laughs> but the longer trans story is the prince was already kissing and sharing secrets with his footman. <laughs> Raised as a boy, the prince's favorite footman was really a girl named Cindy, but only the prince knew her chosen name. They could never marry. The kingdom wouldn't accept it, so he told her. And he wouldn't want anyone else. So when the king insisted he choose at that ball a bride, the prince arranged for Cindy to show up, splendid in tiara and heels, all starry like Andromeda viewed from a moonless mountaintop. When the plan went, the king asked the prince the next day, who was that girl you spent the night with? He'd tell the king to scour the town for Cindy, the one who got away, except that Cindy didn't get away. Instead, she arranged, of course, of course, unbeknownst to him, to pop out from a family friend's garage, then pop the question. <laughs> and the prince said, yes, I've changed my mind. We're not going to hide anymore. That's the version we give the cis, and it's lovely. But the truth is almost nobody gets right. The trans story is that the prince herself is the trans girl in the story. And like so many of us, she spent day after day, before the party, after the party, maybe instead of attending the party, crossing the town, 
ringing doorbells, trawling message boards, scouring yard sales, and barging into shop fronts right before closing to talk to the tired clerks, never giving up her search for the one, the terrific, the just right shoe. <laughs> Speaking of ringing doorbells, uh, do remind your friends and acquaintances to vote. Mm. Uh, even if you think there's no, uh, you know, no big contest and you vote in Massachusetts, you really never know. Please, everybody vote. Um, and uh, if you're, you're, you've been feeling helpless about where we are uh, and you have the ability, there are all kinds of ways to go to New Hampshire and put flyers under people's doors. You don't even have to interact with people. Um, I should read at least one of the holy crap, what's the world coming to? Palms in here, there's a whole section of them. Oh, this is one that Chris, I think, asked for. I have to read it here. Turkeys in Harvard Yard. <laughs> they don't belong, but who does? Maybe their plan is to burn the whole place down. <laughs> Look at them, directing the few pedestrians, overruling stoplights. They have come to see one another as heroes of distributive justice, <laughs> travelers from a pre-Columbian dawn. Their ruffs rise up, their collars make good fans, their waddle-strewn beaks the vehicles for once presumed impossible demands. They remember when everything was icicles, expensive gutters stacked with snow, their toes on crusted ice the only sound. Now they're our anti-fascists. <laughs> While we were limp in our beds, sleep crusting our narrow lashes, they had already taken control of the town. Some more, right? Okay. Long. Oh, okay. Otters. Otter music. Um, have you ever had the experience of just like seeing a couple you're friends with? and just seeing how they're right for each other, and then just going, ah. <laughs> and, then, and then thinking, is that for everyone or for some of us, is that for me? Not knowing? Otter music. They never seem to tire of each other, nor to tire each other out. This pair who never bother with polytests, whose flat paws gather on each other's shoulders, each the other's handhold, help me, sous chef and oyster cracker, keeping up their noses and their patter, batting at their whiskered cheeks, then almost rolling each other over in the shifting, sometimes swifter river water. Their triangular tufts of fur come in ginger and dirty snow white, as well as in oak bark colors, taupe and tea and tan, and grow out denser than any other mammals for such swimmers. Every slip of insulation matters. If you see them slow or falter, less affectionate than their former selves, never fault them. Tell them winter is not a thing. Tell them their own river, the one they do not prefer so much as call home, will never wholly freeze over. Tell them that we too gather in trios, quartets, and pairs, that we shelter our young. Tell them we too grow older and younger, that we too are neotenous, that we defer to the elements reluctantly, though we claim to stare them down with our big eyes, that their forepaws are finer than our oars, that we are the lesser excuse me, lesser divers, lesser rowers, that we also whisper, chatter, splash each other and scream, that many of us too cannot be tamed, that we plummet when we must. Tell them we admire and want to be rescuers even more than to be rescued. 
Tell them we know they would rather find more time together than anything. Tell them we feel the same. Hmm. Hmm. It is Taylor Swift Day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, raise your hand if you've already heard it. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Thumbs up so far? No? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have After Columbicus over there? Is it, it's going to be. <laughs> Should I ask? Oh, yeah. Ooh, the paperback. Okay. Um, there's a poem in here that I feel like I have to read because it's. Um, So, so this is, um, so after Callimachus, which is the book that I did before this book, is all adapted from my favorite ancient Greek poet, a guy called Callimachus, who worked at the Library of Alexandria. Um, he probably wasn't in charge of it, that's probably a myth, but he did work there. Uh, and he was a lot of fun and um, very self-conscious and kind of, there's no will to power, just the will to sort of wit and got made fun of by his peers for that. Um, so this is a version of his epigram 42, which in the original um, begins, uh, we use these instead of titles in this book, um, and if you are an actual classicist, you probably are holding me in mild contempt right now, because you can get that right, but that is sort of how the Greek sounds. <laughs> Half of me, an intangible half, is alive. The other part is gone, I don't know where. Either it's dead or it's lost in what it calls love. Actually, it's a flighty tween, superficial and glittery. Keep your eyes on the printed page. Stop playing with your hair, I tell it, and put down your portable screen. No use. I'm supposed to profess that maturity is a gift, but I don't believe it or else don't care. I amble the library stacks and get lost in YA. I want to go home, paint my nails until they iridesce, clamp on my headphones and pray to Taylor Swift. <laughs> Apparently it worked, we got new albums. <laughs> um, yeah, a few more? Okay, tell me when we get to half an hour and we can. Q and A or okay. Ooh. Okay. Uh, scary one and then another superhero one. Scary one. Okay. The advice from the lights, which was uh, like advice from the lights, which came out in twenty seventeen, and apparently people bought it. It was kind of nice. Um, was that was my like coming out book? My like, hey everybody, I'm trans. It's kind of scary out here. I feel alone, but you know I'm ready. Um, and uh. The book before that, which was called Belmont, was about like parenthood, which is terrifying um, and also great and worth it. And I feel very lucky to have the, the kids that we have, one of whom you just heard from. Apparently their D&D campaign went well, um, but it was very, very scary to be a parent uh, early on when, you know, they don't talk and you don't know what they want because they're just going, ah! <laughs> um, and then they like walk up to the cat and they're scared of the cat and the cat's scared of them and it's it's you have bad dreams and there was a series of homes in in there that were set at different times of day called things like palm of 6 a.m and palm of, of 7 a.m and i thought it was done with that um especially in in this book which is really as chris i, I hope i wrote the book that you described um it was supposed to be a community book a book about really having friends and allies and lovers and and you know people not just person in your life, but, but people. Um, it's a queer community book. It's a poly book. It's a fun book. Uh, it's a book full of superheroes, if I got it right. Uh, but it's also got some fears in it. And I thought I was done writing poems set at ungodly hours in the morning, and I wasn't. Poem of 5 a.m. The fear that you woke up again in your childhood bedroom, that your whole adult life was a dream, there is the plexiglass or perspex case guarding the used paperbacks from volume one to volume 19. 
volume three was a library loan. They make a good team. Outdoors, the flowering plum flips twigs against new leaves like thin collectible coins. One side is a leathery green, the other a lighter, more optimistic green. You pull a bright childhood's lilac and white duvet cover up to your chin. You are not afraid to be seen. You're afraid to be seen. The plum tree agrees with your phone. They want you to get out of bed. You can get out of bed, but not yet. Last week or last decade, you botched your last ever piano recital by composing an original fairy tale silently in your head about people who lived in a ship in a bottle. Where did they go? You have memorized every phase of cell division, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, when new membranes form and part clean as an incision. You turn over the beveled duvet edge pressed to your silent lips. You hope nobody asks you to make a decision. It does get better. We have another request from the chat. Great. For um, a punctuation poem. Okay. Is that also Catherine? Uh, no, it's Rachel Crowther. Oh, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Um, so all the um, all the punctuation marks that speak in this poem are different members of our like giant queer community. And um, this is one that I, I rarely read. I mean, they're also about punctuation and logic and thinking. And if you have already read the book somehow and you didn't notice that they were all letters in the LGBTQ plus alphabet as well as being punctuation marks, that's okay. That's really okay. Um, this one, um, uh, I don't think I've read this one before, but this might be a good time. Uh, this is an exclamation mark who of course is transmasculine. <laughs> All things must come to an end, but I never want them to end. I would rather keep an open book, continue whatever gets me excited, replay a lightning strike or cast a plumb line that may never touch the bottom, crash through every stubborn wall. It's true that I come to a point. I divide each present from every past, but I also exist to celebrate what's next. I support purposiveness, enterprise, and the intrepid spirit of getting things done. That's why I feel deeply akin to vacuum cleaners, to the letter T, to batteries, and to the short and long versions of any handmade stroke that could be the numeral one, or an L, or an I. I am also an ink blot, a sudden stain emerging below a quill pen, a sign of danger and a way to be overjoyed, an antiquated firearm along with smoke from its retort. And I have been able to see myself as a telescope, a way to print the otherwise unprintable, a tale for flight or for seaside escape, and even the kind of anchor that stands for hope. I am the lever big enough to move the world. The world you move, actions and actors, the proof and the claim you prove, the product of all mathematical factors. You cannot use me as a taxi or for a quick lift or just to get yourself from one place to another. I mean to stay. I can announce the end of everything, the feeling of dangling of having the world on a string or else a new day. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you take live requests? Is, is yes, live? they're all live. <laughs> I can take in-person requests, yeah. Yeah, great, yeah. Oh, okay, sure. I think this is the first time I've done a, an event with multiple audience requests when no one, oh no, one of them was an X-Men poem, Never mind. Okay. Okay, one of them was an X-Men poem. Okay. 
We are mermaids. The salt of the ocean is always the salt of tears. Melancholy. Oh, I can't move around because I'm on camera. <laughs> Melancholy, but at the right dilution or concentration, life giving. It has been there since before the beginning of tragedy, when what would become us was just trying to get through the day. We know the consistent waves as they ride fortune's helical gears, sacrificing their poise for their careers, need not be the only mode of living. Look down, the thermophiles sip at the fumaroles whose sulfur steam would kill a human being. They love it here. And the mottled, diffident, ray-finned fish known as zoarchids or eel pout, all shrugs and S-curves, choose to nose along the floor of the rough world. They are both predators and prey with gills and wide set eyes instead of a face. You don't have to be useful. You are not required to come up with something to say. You can spend your life benthic or brackish, subsisting and even thriving where a fingertip comes away saline and still refreshing, exploring the estuary, the submerged lip and conjuries of overlapping shores on the green black water, the harbor, the bay. You can live with your doubt. That's why it's yours. Some of us are going to be okay. Like one more, two more. Okay, and then Q&A time? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. People like Sappho here, Sappho fans. So uh, this is a version of Sappho 31 set during X-Men Gold number 30, published in, I believe, uh, 20, is it 2019? I think it's 2019. Before the wedding. That man you're standing next to for so long, I looked up to him like a god. You were immured in conversation, and when he smiles back at you now, my heart skips and not for him. Tonight, I need armor to look at you. When I want to tell you how we should be together, no human language comes out. I have known this feeling that warms then scalds me before. When you and I touch, that's the best and the worst. I'm brittle tin, I'm paler than drought grass. I shake, my eyes turn black, and I can't see you anymore. And yet I do. I am going to survive this experience, even if it's like coming back from the dead. Still, I wish I could be taking your hand now, even if my horns and tail would show. Let's go upstairs for a minute and look at the moon. Is it Q&A time or one more poem? Oh, one more. Okay, okay. I got to read my OTP poem, so. <laughs> okay, some of us here know what an OTP is. <laughs> okay, that was my OTP poem. Um, hmm. This one was in the Harvard Review published across the street by really thoughtful people. And I believe the poet Major Jackson, who I had the good fortune to read with last week, uh, was part of selecting it. Wildflower Meadow, Meadow Weasla. It's a park in Maine. The many oared asters are coracles. The goldenrod pods, triremes. They do not plan their voyages to please us. The tangle of brambles and droops shifts only slightly when the wind attempts to part 
the knee or waist high stalks and thorns? What will you do or be in that state you fear and look forward to when none of them need us after the last seeds leave? Thank you for being here. I think we're supposed to Q&A just a little bit. Bookstores hate it when you go on too long because then people have to get home and they don't buy books. And then the bookstore is sad and goes out of business. Um, I want to encourage you to buy not only books by me, but books by many other people, which I'm going to do on the way out. Um, because look around, read at whim, read random stuff. Um, who's sitting near E? Anyone sitting near E? Or maybe? Got any, any Angie Estes in there? Got Alan Peterson's books here? Yes. Okay. Uh, you know what? Someone is going to leave here with an Alan Peterson book. <laughs> this is an absolutely, he just kind of hangs out writing amazing poems. His first book comes, that came out when he was like in his 50s. Uh, he taught painting in Florida. He's now retired to Oregon. He's really, really brilliant. And if you're like an A.R. Ammons fan, people here like Ammons? Woo! Yeah. I'm going to read you a short Alan Peterson poem. Just in time. The first time I was the center of something, it was freezing. Vowels glittered like snowbanks, the amboys gold on silver at that hour. Like the antique spoon, my remarkable molecules were birds of the sun, morning doves reading aloud from their delicate laments. Most of their flyway through my chest and coughs. I was seven in Minnesota, just in time. This morning, it all came back in the few minutes between electricity and springs, between the numbers constructed of straight lines and the hands that swept the fates. It's describing waking up. Like Marigold smoothing her dress between morning and downtown. In those small minutes, the future could be confused. An unthinking arrow passed through the body of a signet, then a swan. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't have promotional megaphones. He doesn't do other kinds of writing. He's not like a television talking head. He's just really good. <laughs> Someone by Alan Peterson. <laughs> Should I throw it at the audience? You know, I don't want that to freak people out. Seriously, here, you sell somebody Alan Peterson books. Yeah. Okay. Time for a few questions. We'll open it up to the floor. Alan Peterson. Hi. Hi. So tell us about that. More about that ancient Greek, ancient Greek library. What oh yeah, he's he's amazing. So so his his thing. He's born in what's now Libya, and um, he spends most of his adult life in Alexandria, uh, which is the major literary city of of the time. Um, and if you want to envision him, you do need to envision him dark skinned. When we were doing the promo for this book, the promo people just kept giving me you know, white photographs of white people from ancient Greece. And I was just like, no, no, this person does not look like me. Um, and he, the tradition has it, he was a, a teacher, which was a low status profession at the time, then a librarian. And he was a prolific and much admired and very uh, versatile author. He wrote epic, he wrote hymns, he wrote epigrams, he sort of wrote jokes. He wrote poems to honor the Ptolemaic, which were uh, Greek descended rulers of Italy. Um, he wrote wedding songs. Uh, he wrote essentially satire. He wrote a long poem called the Aetia, which is Greek for origin stories, um, telling the origin stories and explanations for weird stuff in the ancient Mediterranean world. Why does this town have no statues of people on horses? Why are all the statues on foot? Why does this town have a tradition that you never say the name of the town or describe the founders? Like what's up with that? Uh, why does the temple to Hera instead of a statue of Hera have just like a plank of wood here? Um, super versatile and super technically gifted. If you wanna think about modern 
um, analogs. Uh, you can think about James Merrill a little bit, a little bit merrily. Um, and just like Merrill, he got uh, attacked. And like modern Taylor Swift, he got attacked for being gossipy, uh, too into his own technique, um, inauthentic, uh, sort of queer in the wrong way. They wouldn't have said that then, but like not heroic, not Homeric enough, not for real, into artifice, maybe not grown up enough. And uh, his response was, F you, I meant to do that. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I love the guy. And when I, I started doing some versions of his work, some friends of mine who were connected to the Princeton University translation series asked me if I would do a book of him. And, and I said, would you really publish it? And they said, well, if we like it. <laughs> so I ended up just doing versions of Polemicus, and it was really fun to translate because he has queer stuff and poly stuff and weird gender stuff, and also, uh, if you want, you can make him have feminist stuff and modern political stuff, although sometimes you have to reverse the meaning of the originals because, you know, classical antiquity, what can you do? Um, <laughs> and, and funeral stuff and self-conscious literary career stuff, really fun. Um, and I got to write a series of poems, all of which sort of say something and have arguments because poems from classical antiquity always either tell a story or have an argument. And it was at a time when I was kind of tired of reading modern poems that did not have these things. Mm -hmm. um, so does that help? Yeah, that's a cool look at this. Yeah. Hi. Oh, I mean, so many. Um, I think the, the living poets who I've copied the most from and learned the most from probably include in no particular order, uh, Terrence Hayes, Laura Kashisky, Paul Muldoon, maybe D.A. Powell. Um, and then in terms of dead people, Bishop Moore, Merrill, John Donne, that help? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Randall Jarrell is a poet I'll always love. I wrote a book and a half about the guy. I've kind of inhaled him. He kind of lives somewhere and behind my red earlobe. <laughs> Hi. Wait, we have two. One of them, too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you talk about um, writing in persona? Yeah. Um, I've taught your Super Stephanie poems and your Embraer to me. And my yeah. students always respond to them enormously. I just wonder if you can talk about your practice. Oh yeah, no, it's when, when people ask me to like teach a master class, which is a term I hate, like we need a new term for that. Cause I don't want to master anyone. I want to help people. Um, I, I, persona poems are fun for me because you can represent part of yourself without having to tell the whole story of how you got that way. You can find ways of representing your feelings without having to create a realistic narrative. Mm. And you can speak for someone who's really not you without having to worry about cultural appropriation, mm. right? Like I don't want to write a poem in the voice of an, you know, transmasculine Armenian American person who grew up in Tallahassee because I'm not those things, right? And, and that's for a person with those demographics to write. And if I were writing novels, I might want that person as a supporting character, right? Because no one, no one wants white people to write novels with no people of color in them. And no one wants, I don't want cis people to write novels that never have any trans people, right? For supporting characters and narrative, you want to do the research and have diversity. But if you're gonna write 20 lines that speak from the heart of someone, I do worry about cultural appropriation. But a stapler, right? <laughs> or uh, Alison Blair, Dazzler from the X-Men, who is a fictional character owned by a company, <laughs> or you know, a crocodile is not going to read the poem and say, you know, that's not okay. I can speak <laughs> for myself. That's you can't, you can't cultural appropriate a stapler. <laughs> 
Um, and so I find that I'm able to get just a lot of different kinds of tones and experiences and just get the fuck out of myself uh, by writing in personae uh, and in, in personae that, that you know, could not be real people. This is also an argument for fantasy and science fiction as kinds of narrative, by the way. And the other, the story behind the airplanes poem is, is that it's, it's about trans community and parenthood and real people, you know who you are. Um, but it also comes from reading a couple of very good novels that have dragons in them. And the one that, the ones that really stand out that I, I recommend to everyone I know at this point are a series of novels by Rachel Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N, beginning with Serafina. Mm. Um, so if you feel like reading a fantasy novel, that's in, in that poem. Does that help? Thank you for teaching my work. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned. We should, you, can, you, know how, you know how to reach me. Do you know how to reach me? Of course. Hi, Anna. Hi. Anna. Hi. You, oh, you have a new book. Yes. Yeah. Anna Ross has a new book. Do you have Anna's new book? It's not out yet. No, next month. Next month. Are you reading here? What's the date? The seventh. Everybody go wait the seventh? Mm -hmm. Oh no. Uh, what's the what time what's the timing? The thing is the, the seventh at seven. Okay, we're gonna have to move. I'm I'm reading, it's a Wednesday, right? It is, yeah. I am also reading on the seventh oh, at Harvard Bookstore. Well we'll have to get together afterwards. No, we'll have to change the time <laughs> so I can hear you. <laughs> can, we, can we can we make it like a can we talk about changing the time for that? Because I want to go to your book launch. Let's talk about it. Cause you should all go hear Anna, but you should also hear Laura. Ah, I know. Kermit the Frog. Ah. And, then, and then one more. What ice cream will you be getting tonight? Ah. Um, it depends on what they have at the ice cream store. Um, I will say that if they have lemon ice cream, we're getting that cause that is Nathan's. Got it. Nathan's the kid who did not call me. <laughs> sure. You mentioned the persona writing exercise. Does that have anything to do with Carl Jung's persona? No. no. <laughs> it literally has nothing to do with Carl Jung. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, Carl Jung was kind of an expansive thinker. Every, he could, everything could have to do with Jung. Um, but uh, no, Jung has been uh, really useful to some of my friends as a way of thinking about the divided parts of the self. Um, there are psychoanalytic thinkers who I'm really a fan of, but that's no that's sorry <laughs> sorry i feel like just saying no is like the wrong question to end on one more question and then you can buy alan peterson's book yes hi as as, as the only professor i know who's ever been at something baylor um is <laughs> lavender hayes gay or not <laughs> background please the, like from the from the like lavender haze the tracks like like as in the oh, whole discourse about wait, the lavender haze wait 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 lavender uh, haze is the name of a track on the taylor swift album that dropped this no, morning this morning yeah <laughs> no, okay and then there was like all of the discourse about whether it was like actually gay or not so okay. i feel like i need to ask someone who would actually have like, a better answer than i do okay so I love that as a question. Um, I absolutely headcanon Taylor Swift as bi. Um, I don't want to invalidate her troubled relationships with men, which she says are romantic and erotic. And I don't, I just, people, you should believe people when they say who they are. Um, but of, of course she's written some of the most, you know, wonderful lesbian love songs in modern times especially recently, right? It's nice to have a friend and seven and, you know. Um, is Lavender Haze one of those songs? I don't know, because the album just dropped this morning. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've only listened to it twice so far. Uh, but it's a good question and I'll get back to you. <laughs> On that note, let's give Stephanie another round. Thank you for signing books. If you could all please move your chairs up against the wall, I would be grateful. Thank you for coming.
Thank you all for coming. Yeah, buy, buy things. If, if, if you can, buy things from the Grow Your Poetry Bookshop and support them. I would be honored. Okay, I need to sign with something. I can, I'll, I, I've got a pen somewhere. Okay. It's nice to have a pen. Okay. All I have is lipstick. Just for Emily? To Emily. To Emily. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Okay. One of those the display copy here. No, the, I don't know. I, just I think this is this is a display copy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I just love you. Thank you so much. You're such a wonderful.